Now we're good? Yeah. Okay. Well, so first off, thank you guys very much for being willing participants to do this. And um, if you wouldn't mind, why don't you take a minute to introduce yourself to the audience? Uh, uh, my name is Tom Stormer. I'm with Best for Trust. Uh, sort of AV uh, architect, uh, endpoint engineering. Uh, I put tech and collaboration systems together uh, for our company. I'm Jason Moss with uh, QSC, um, but uh, for the past nine years I was at Logitech and was one of the original founders of our Logitech Video Collaboration Group. They're doing a bunch of various roles, so when I talk to, to David and Michael about doing this panel, I'm going to be kind of talking about two perspectives, kind of uh, my new role <coughs> at QSC, but you know, what I saw in the collaboration space over that last nine years in Logitech. Excellent, and, and Jason and I keep meeting on panels. So just inadvertently you know, going up in the same place and talking about the same things. Jason, for people who don't know, what is QSC? So, how many people in here can spell QSC? <laughs> I knew I was in every room full of smart people. So, uh, QSC, um, you know, I, I joined them, you know, Logitech's been doing a fantastic, amazing company, but then I saw a really amazing opportunity at QSC that is really transitioning from a traditional AV company that has been focused on audio and speakers and DSPs to their systems business. So I know some of the people in the room are very familiar with this, but not a lot of people really know the power of what QSC is doing and really defining a audio, video, and control over IP networks and being able to do some amazing things. QSC has been in, it's pretty much every major theme park globally is running on QSC cruise ships, museums, two-thirds of the NFL stadiums are running on the QSIS platform. It's truly amazing that if you've been following the company over the last few years, we've been bringing down the price points and endpoints, so now we're making a bigger and bigger play into the corporate enterprise space, and the opportunity to do that um, was what attracted me to QSIS. Great. Thank you for sharing. So, first off, feel free to raise your hands if you have questions. We're not a formal um, because that deck went really wide, I have eight questions up here that are fairly wide. Um, I don't know if we'll get to all of eight. We can get to two of them. We can just address audience questions. It's really whatever you like. But I suppose an easy place to begin is question one, which is what platform are you about to deploy? Did you deploy? And how are you using it? And I can make myself a third panelist or David can as well if we if we if we. I'm not sure. It. I thought you were. Yeah. You, you, you came out of it today out of your show? So Tom, do you want to begin? Uh, sure. Um, so we're in the infancy of, uh, of deploying uh, 365. We, we've escaped the uh, was it paralysis through analysis. <laughs> Is that the uh, nomenclature? So we're, we're getting out of that and we're actually deploying it to uh, between a dozen and two dozen lucky IT folks because we get our dog food and then we go out and find representative employees and colleagues from different departments so that we can get their perspective, bring that in, and try to suss out all the pain points before we do a broader deployment. Um, as part of it, we're heavily leveraging information security because there are many aspects to Teams 0365. You know, some of them are a bit daunting. You know, the, the paradigm of being able to create call them user groups or distribution uh, lists, giving that to everybody's, you know, giving that to everybody and the potential for them to overshare, you know. That's it's pretty scary, scary, right? It, it is, it is, because, you know, in the old world with uh, NTFS and share permissioning, you know, we had a notion of that once, and you know, we, we, we don't want that. Yes. So let me ask one other question. Before you do, Who? Oh, yeah. I see my question. How did you come to the decision? So after all, first of all, who, who did the analysis? And at the end of that, you know, where did the decision come from, right? Um, it came from high up. From high up, okay. Yeah, yeah, uh, we went to the MCT. Um, I'm not just like saying Microsoft Technology MCT. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they, at first we were thinking Teams was just this you know, very powerful chat. And we went there and we saw how heavily it integrated into the 365 and all the potential and, and all the value within that 
purchase. So you know, it, it, it represents a lot of value. I think to your point earlier, best of breed versus 8% there, when there's 8% there and a lot of silos, it becomes a, a very compelling value proposition. So very high level, that's analysis, some education, people made a decision, and was it then turned to the rest of the team and said, okay, go figure out how to do this? Yeah, and we're doing it right now. You know, people, people are kind of, you know, one of the biggest things is like uh, starting a new thread as opposed to applying in a thread. <laughs> I mean, it's just silly stuff that's even something IT folks. So, you know, we're going to get a lot of messaging around this and we're going to uh, incorporate assistance from HR and potentially, you know, marketing even to do internal messaging to, as you were alluding to, promote and, and really sell the value of this and you know people don't like change and we're going to try to you know <laughs> to, to help them you know I mean when we went to office 2007 I think that when they introduced the ribbon uh, just that was, was, was almost acute you know absolutely people definitely struggle with change um, how about you Jason so yeah so let me talk about the, the Logitech experience first so Logitech was a uh, Headquarters in Switzerland, so at Logitech we embraced our Swissness, and um, we kind of used everything because we were in the we, we played with Microsoft and Zoom and Google and all these folks. So uh, Logitech was a uh, G Suite customer, so there was Hangouts and chat being used, um, even though that wasn't one of the three that you mentioned. Um, and that was kind of being used kind of corporate wide, but our division is we're the only enterprise focused division at Logitech. We define a lot of everything, so our Engineering and product teams use Slack. And then our sales force adopted Teams because the majority of the customers are still using Teams and Microsoft. And so our sales organizations adopted Teams. And just for good measure, we still use Jabber for cell phones. But that is slowly dying because everybody just switched over to cell phones. So, uh, and um, our corporate meeting platform was Zoom. And we were the first large, multi billion dollar company to actually adopt Zoom, you know, quite a few years ago. So. We have a little of everything. There. So, so next question: when you, If someone had a little meeting room, gather a bunch of people around the table, have a meeting, and use video, what they use? Zoom. <laughs> and did everybody was everybody comfortable with it? Did everybody know how to use Zoom? Yeah. So Logitech had very much a video culture because you know a few years back, um, Logitech used to own Life Size, and um, there was something about 500 meeting rooms globally, and it was deployed with all Life Size systems. And the big reason that Logitech ended up selecting Zoom originally was because of the connector service. So all those, all that equipment that was life size, even though Logitech divested of life size, we still own all the equipment there. And Zoom provided a really interesting platform to migrate from those legacy dedicated codecs to more of a soft codec. But you know, Zoom was really the, the new platform that was adopted. Great. You, you look. Uh, audience. So How many people are using Team Chat platform? Show of hands. You know it's turning. Okay, so we've got uh, a third of the audience. Multiple Team Chat platforms. Keep your hand in the air. Okay. Um, who's using uh, um, Slack? Microsoft Teams. Cisco WebEx Teams. G Suite. Any other one I didn't mention? And Zoom chat. So, you know, it's, it's just as big as yeah. you know, it's, it's patterns and everything. So I have a question. With the people that are using multiple platforms, and, and I'm just curious because I need to figure this out. The one thing that's neat about one platform is everything comes into one place and I can stay. If I, if I buy into what they're, they're telling me, I can stay in one place. How does that work when you have multiple platforms? Well, that's it. That's interesting. <laughs> because the, I think the mix and match. Oh, let me clap your mic. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. I apologize. Go, go. Um, I said I think that portion is interesting because I think the mix and match use of multiple platforms sometimes is not limited to just corporate use. Some of it is uh, legacy use from other companies you have uh, consulted with before, so a relationship with or that forester. The current state of affairs is that we're, we're in a state of flux. We have old technology that's still there. We call it legacy, but we're still using it. It's still functional, and it is still its 
proper instance of capacity where I work with us. And then we have the new ones who are seizing more time from us than the previous. But they still all coexist. So when you ask the question, I'm trying to think, are you talking about bathrooms only in the workplace or outside the workplace as well because they all command those services in our time? Well, I, I was initially thinking about it in the workplace only, but you know, I'll tell you, so a very close friend of mine, who's managing director of a very large global uh, uh, management consulting firm. When I asked him about it, he said, yep, in the firm, teams, that's what we use. Outside of that, the board, when you use on several boards, it's, we, we use Slack for that. Right? And, there's and, and, and there's overlap. But yeah. one of my questions to my friend was, you know, I know how I get alerted to notifications in teams. Again, I'm just looking at one place. I, I wonder if you, if you have to start managing and looking in multiple places, am I back to the problem that I have with the email just without all the sifting and sorting? I, I'm so curious to hear what, what that experience is like. Yes. I have a question. We've been talking Microsoft and Teams. What are you recommending for your customers who are all Apple houses? So my customers are Apple houses predominantly um, are using Cisco WebEx and Slack. And are they using that just for collaboration or are they using it for video as well? They're using Cis the Cisco side, Cisco for, Cisco side for video. For video. Okay. They're using Slack for, for, for chat and collaboration. Um, the other thing uh, that I'll tell you is that they're also, some of them are starting to introduce in uh, Zoom as well. Right, but, but Cisco is Cisco's, um, very popular in the, in the Apple community. But I would say that um, an interesting dynamic that has changed since Satya Nadella took over at Microsoft is now I go to Redmond and everybody has an iPhone. And if you, so the Teams application on iOS is actually probably the best implementation of Teams, you know, even more so than on Windows. And they're designing for that environment first. And you're seeing a lot of interesting adoption there because that's what they are using every day. Well, what, the, to follow up to that, right? So I used to spend a lot of time there, um, like every week. And, <laughs> and you know, some of the demands that they would put on their rooms, they needed to support AirPlay. Super, super important, right? I mean, they needed Miracast, but they needed, they needed AirPlay and they needed to see this environment. And part of that was their customers, because people, their customers are coming into their campuses, they're coming into their MTCs, they're coming into their experience and briefing centers, and their customers need to be able to share. And what are their customers using? Their customers are using uh, iPhones. I'll tell you one other funny story in that I am a Mac person, right? And I used to go to meetings all the time at Microsoft. <laughs> and the first time I was afraid to take my computer out. So I told my IT department, I need a service. And they gave it to me. Now, I've been using native Mac for years, uh, since probably, I don't know, 2000, at least, at least five years ago, right? I converted it over. So I don't know how to use Windows 10. I mean, I do, but I don't, right? I'm not efficient yet. And I get to that first meeting, and I take out the service on my bumper or whatever, and then I saw somebody in the room pull out a Mac, and it was all okay, it was all cool. And after that meeting forward, I just took my Mac, and they were more than happy, because they said, you know what? You're using our software, you're, you're giving us licenses, they're happy to have it. I'll tell you, it's not exactly the same if you flip that around. I spent a lot of time at the other place also. <laughs> right. So, so it's, it's just different, and it, it's all about their customers or their internal culture. The different challenges. Um, one thing that I don't think I mentioned yesterday was, or the other day that when I was talking was, and you just touched upon it, Michael, is part of the challenge of it being is you know, we do have all these modalities from the tool sets, and, and the challenge from a large corporation side now is, uh, this is not a question, it's just my blathering for a second, so bear with me. Uh, <laughs> but the biggest issue we have is, you know, we have tens, hundreds, thousands of E3 or E5 licenses. So I don't want to say that we're forced to use tool sets because we're already paying for those licenses, and they're certainly not free, you know, they're included. So you've got kind of that model where it's an included um, cost that's embedded within your E3 you know, licensing specifically for Microsoft. Cisco's doing something very similar now too from their from their new model of licensing. Um, so I think that's why you're seeing that partition, if you will, from the from the tool sets where you, you do have to manage each one from a large corporation perspective. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with you 100 percent on that. You know, money or cost definitely impacts, but the other piece to it, if you've been using some of it for a while, like you think about merging companies and bringing companies in, 
So one of the client companies I work with a lot on the West Coast, uh, some of them earlier, you know, they were uh, on Google. It's G Suite for everything, and they were acquired. And the person that acquired them used something else. And they had this big body of heads. And it finally ended with, you guys can stay on G Suite. Why? Because productivity would have gone to the floor if, if they were forced to change the way they work because it's difficult, right? So there's lots of factors that that's right there. Jason, do you think? Yeah, to, to kind of follow up with that question. So as I went over to QSC, um, you know, they're still on-prem. They haven't even made the move to Office 365 yet. And part of my other role as part of the executive team is kind of our digital transformation of our, our workforce. So partnering with the IT leadership on just kind of bringing the company into the modern space. And there is a lot of debate already happening. Oh, should we be trying out Slack? You know, we, we like, you know, we have little pockets of Zoom here and there and things like that. And then it was just getting to a certain point where you kind of mentioned the analysis for by paralysis, they just weren't advancing. And I discovered that this conversation had been going on for about 18 months. And from my experience of kind of using all the platforms and understanding what the company did, it's like, there's not really that much difference. In, in the capabilities of the things. You covered it all here. It's it's just personal preference. I said, you're already going to Office 365. Teams is free. Let's just start with that and let's kind of get off because there was just too much analysis and there really isn't that much of a difference from this. And so just kind of sticking with what the employee base was already somewhat comfortable with, we felt that it was that was going to help us in the adoption from the employee base by not just going to something that we and that's how I would view it because, again, on the surface, they're really similar. And, and I, mean, I almost couldn't have gone through those slides fast enough to say, when you look at them, they, they all do the same thing. On the back end, they're different. Right? But could I, you know, can I do document sharing with any of them? Absolutely. I just buy the right license and connect and, and do the right integration, and it's not a problem. My end users don't know, and they don't care. So, right? I think kind of what you're talking to is are the nuances between the two platforms worthy of, of spending serious money, you know, that, that becomes the, the value. The question, I was going to add a kind of comment to it, is, is it isn't surprising that there's multiple platforms being used in companies outside of the, in the line of other companies, because workflow still is localized to, to teams and units and stuff, and there's always a break in that, like, you may be working on a product, you were uh, adopting it, and eventually it's going to stop if you're not inviting the president chat to look at the document you're going to present and so you create that workflow and then that what happens that may go somewhere mm -hmm. different on that piece of it. So how can people work I think that's the at the end of the day that's to me that's the biggest driver behind this. Like let's figure out the strategy. Let's figure out how people operate what they're comfortable with. The neat thing is there are lots of good platforms out there and the back ends are flexible enough that if I have the time and the smarts and I'm willing to pay for it, I can make them, I can make them work, right? The question is how, at the end of the day, how do I use this to drive more business, to get more accomplished faster, to increase the academic uh, experience, right? That's why I'm buying these things. And so it's just, I find sometimes people get lost in it forget that they just go down the, down the um, too deep down the tunnel on a particular technology. Yeah, what I think you said is really powerful because it, a lot of these things get really enhanced by the dynamics of the team. So at Logitech, the product and engineering team loved that sales was not on Slack, right? Keep those guys like away. Like in addition to everything I've described too, like a big moment for me was when the China team invited me to their WeChat groups because they have a whole nother thing that they're doing on the side. So, ooh, I, mean, I, I made it in the club and that I can now talk with them on WeChat. But I think there is this interesting social norm where people want to have their nice contained environment where if it, it does proliferate company-wide, are the wrong people going to get invited into my groups? And there's this level of uncertainty if it's a generic platform that everybody has, how can I keep my, my workflows siloed into the work that I need to do? But it's a really powerful comment. Well, let me, let me comment on that because I'd like to also introduce a little bit of controversy on this because I've been, uh, been known to be a contrarian around uh, the team chat platform. I've been known to be a contrarian about everything. But anyway, um, the interesting thing in, in the entire team chat modality, whether you're talking about Slack or Microsoft Teams or Cisco WebEx Teams or G Suite or any of the other ones, is that it really works well 
when you have engaged teams that are interested in participating. So if you're on a team of three or four or five people and everybody's involved in the project and they care about it, and one person comments, the, the other five, six people in the team, they all comment, you get a lot of work done, it's very productive. But you get one guy or one girl or one person that doesn't follow the chat. Now you're spending just as much time as you would, in fact double the time, participating in the room and chasing that person down over email because they're not in the chat. It's like we asked this question three days ago, why didn't you answer it? Oh, I don't look in the chat room. Why don't you look in the chat room? So it comes down to when you're in an engaged team, any of these tools are fine. But when you're talking about when you're one of the big financial services companies or big pharmaceutical companies, and you are rolling this out to hundreds of thousands of people, I don't know that you can roll it out and say, you must only use this platform. This is our platform. It comes back to what we heard on the, the Gen Z and millennial platform. Uh, presentation that you've got to meet people where they are and they may be on WeChat or they may be on FaceTime or they may be something so you guys have used this extensively the three of you are you running into any of these you know I really wish so and so would be participating in this because we can get some work done yes and, 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 listen there's a live screen going on or at least you're recording it and then it's going to get a little careful but but, but let me say it a different way in my I understand, I understand what people like and don't like. And I understand that I'm going to get to the end result that I want, which is greater productivity, if I'm a little flexible with certain individuals and platforms, which is why, even as a small business, I'm probably going to have to. Right? And then, but if I go a little further, it comes back to something you said before. So we're a design company. I have project managers. I have designers. I have engineers. They all think and work differently. Right? And what's interesting is if I look at the people and what they like and don't like, they really fit in the two buckets. And those two buckets, I think, will work well with respect to the work streams and the productivity. And only two of us are probably going to have to deal with managing uh, two platforms, which is why I asked that question before. And I would say, you know, from what we heard this morning, it was most everybody here this morning for the Gen Z uh, group, uh, the, the, the young lady uh, who worked for Compass. She even said it, you know, she'll take what the company has given them and work with that tool. There, these are outside of different tools that sometimes work, it's a little squirrely. But I think there's a, a power in having a very strong, tops down driven cultural norm that this is our, our platform. Everybody has to be on this platform. If you're not responding to this platform, you're not doing your work. There, there needs to be at least some level of parentalism to the implementation of these things, or it doesn't work. I would say the best example that I've seen of one of these things really adopted well is, um, how many people are familiar with the company Envision? Envision app, it's a design software. Um, they're, they're well known because they are they claim to be the largest 100% distributed company in the world. I think last time I saw them, they did uh, 1,200 employees. They have no physical offices, and so they go through this very rigorous onboarding and training program for everybody who comes in. And they use three platforms, or, or three platforms they talk about. They use Slack, um, and they use that for what they call pop your head over the cubicle, coffee, you know, coffee machine, hallway conversations. So they, they engage them that. Then they use Zoom. Zoom is for meetings. And then they enforce that. And then they have uh, email. Emails are for what they say documentation. You need to send out a process, a memo, something that you're, you're and then they go through a two-week onboarding program. Envision is a design application. They, everybody who starts, even if they're not, it could be a finance person, an IT person, and a designer. They have to do a project together using all those tools plus their Envision tool for two weeks. And then they have to meet. They, that same group meets monthly to build this camaraderie around how they work together. And it's a fascinating case study in how to drive a company culture with no physical connections. Everything is 100% remote. They do once a year, like a big kind of um, uh, kind of conference where they bring the company together. So the, the chief people officer, he, he just left recently, Mark Freeman, but Sam Lookout, he's actually writing a book about how they've been able to develop a culture around this. But I think the key lesson taking away from that is that every single person who walks in that company from day one knows how they have to communicate and knows what the expectation is. Sure, there will be side conversations going different ways, but everybody knows if you're gonna be successful at a company, you use 
Slack for this way, Zoom for meetings, emails for documentation. I think, it, I think it's firm but benevolent guidance. Yeah. It's like, you know, we're going to give you tools, you know, use these. If you have genuine concerns, please articulate them. And, you know, we'll either try to address it or you know, the mass of people who can adopt it successfully. So, I would just sort of come out as contrarian as, as David, but I'll, I'll go on the optimist side of it. Uh, to a certain degree, I think that you, everybody tends to forget that this is not a problem that hasn't been in front of us before from an IT organization. You go back to, you look at solutions like um, email, choice. Uh, another great example, which is easy to, to look at, is uh, file shares. So, very similar situation, right? You know, years ago, Three, four, five years ago, we were looking at tool sets saying, okay, how do we get off the file, you know, network driven file shares? We're going to go to Box, we're going to go to G Drive, we're going to go to um, Dropbox, you know, the enterprise, you know, the enterprise flavor of the, the, those tool sets kind of drove us into these different arenas. Mm -hmm. So, not any different in the sense of, uh, you know, making choices available to the end users. So, I, I guess the point I'm making is, is it a problem that we ultimately have to solve? And I think that that's kind of the, the net net of us looking at it is, yeah, we want, from an end user perspective, we want the best experience for, for our end users and customers. And I think that that's why we consternate over this so much to say, okay, what's the right choice? Mm -hmm. um, but it's more around, again, from my side, I, I'm focusing on things like the what tool when, and just kind of giving those users that choice. And again, the other thing I was going to add, to, similar to the other part, was, um, Sometimes you don't have a choice because if you're dealing with an external customer and they're using, you know, Box or they're using Teams or WebEx Teams or whatever, you need to balance that because again, you have to be, you know, ultimately you have to be flexible. So, so. And then um, I just want to make some comments because I recently just moved companies, and so um, we were talking about it coming up from the top, and I was amazed when moving over to my new company. Their their team job, so I'm at Barco now. I've said this. Um, and and so like I was like previously Michael and I collaborated on teams you know together every day every, every day, day. We'd be I mean, like to because he was out there like he said at Microsoft every week or at the other one and he needed you know engineering help and I was there and I was bullish on teams like I never opened up Skype for business when I was at Crestron because I wanted to get I was also the SMB so that's also why but I wanted to get everybody over to teams. But I was shocked that, so Barbara just, I think, deployed teams out to the company like three months ago or something, and I've only been there for four weeks. I'm amazed at how much people are already using it and collaborating on it because there's this top down, all the way from Belgium, collaborative, you know, all these sorts of resources. And obviously, I'm an edge case, right? I'm going to go hunt down, like, how is Barbara using teams so I can take the most advantage of it. But just, I think, what, last week, the head of the Americas at Barco added everybody to this new team where it's like, this is where we're going to talk. This is, it almost seems like this is kind of where we're going to move away from Yammer and the teams. And then you all, all of a sudden have all these people liking things. I was just amazed because, you know, like, Michael and I used teams a lot, you know, at Crestron. I used it with other people with different departments and broke down a lot of silos there using that platform. But there was, there was still a lot of people who were, weren't using it in Crestron has had teams for a long time now, you know? I think one of the other differences there, so, so culturally, everybody had an office and everybody had a desk. And I did too, except I was never there. Right. right? Yeah. But, but, the, but the point is, if you, if you have that place and you go to that place and, and you know, you're working with four people that sit around your queue, you, you know, you just kind of talk with them. That's but when you're not in that environment, you have to find other tools in order to be successful. And so, I mean, I can tell you that I view a video meeting no different than an in-person meeting. As long as I can see you and hear you, right, and, and I can share information, to me, that's super powerful. And uh, I actually have a hard time working with certain individuals when they don't think of video. Like, they're like, what do you mean? I, I, I can't, how am I going to work with someone who's in New York? They're, they're there. Mm -hmm. I'm here. Mm -hmm. I don't get that. So, anyways. Yeah, that's a valid point. I mean, we did a lot of work within um, at sales and restaurant to build that team up because we were right there. Like, I literally would walk over. So we weren't using the chat functions because we were next to each other, but we were using the collaboration, file sharing and stuff, and it, it 
begrudgingly doing it and, and they're not seeing benefit or improvement. I would say, so I can answer it two ways. From, from the, the love check standpoint, it definitely, in, from the time I was there, it started out very much as an in-person culture. You had to be there, you had to go to the office. You know, I had a long commute from San Francisco into down to the East Bay, which was three hours round trip driving, you know, Bay Area traffic, which sucks. Uh, but these tools, as people got more and more comfortable with it, people got more and more comfortable with the idea that you were being productive when they didn't see your face because they could see online activity and things going back and forth. So I think it really made a massive difference in the ability to have distributed teams and the comfortability of um, the team that I hired less than, I'd say only about 30% of them were locally based. The rest of them were distributed around the country and it gave me an amazing way to, to get the best talent. And one of the people that I hired, I brought her in originally as a consultant. Um, she was based in Austin, Texas. And I could not get the organization to hire her she was in Austin. She was a consultant for us for two years, and then they hired her full time because they could see the levels of productivity. So I think that was the real powerful change that I saw over over the nine years I've watched I've been using these types of tools. Real quick, it's real quick. It's, it's kind of ironic the conversation we're having. We're talking about tools that we mandate in organization. And all the names that are coming up are tools that found success by organic growth by people identifying uniquely how it benefits them and their personal work structure. Um, I think we have to appreciate the personal tech stacks that people build. That is, it's not a single application that is driving success. It's the multiple applications they develop, their personal tech stack that they build that gives them kind of a, a sense of personal achievement by saying, here's how I get my business done. It's not that these tools are affecting anything individually. It's how people are adopting them and building that complete stack that is generating more success, more productivity coming from them. So I think that the, the bar is being raised because of the personal success that people have found in, in uniquely identifying the tool they want to use to get more done with less. Um, but yeah, it's a, the, we're having the top-down mandate conversation, but the bottom-up identification of new technology to get the job done is where I think all of the success is coming from this conversation. I think it depends on the environment. I mean, if you're responsible for audit and you have to control all the all the settings on any of these apps, as you go wide, it becomes <coughs> tenuous at best to try to, to, try to exercise any control over them. Uh, also, from the standpoint of support, you know, that, that, that also factors in. Uh, I, I think what some companies do is if uh, they'll allow people to bring their own apps, more flexible companies, and, and support is best effort, right? Like you can have your tool, but you know we're, we're not going to be able to help you if it doesn't do exactly what you need. So let me ask a follow-up question to that. Um, right, we have another one back here. Oh, I'm sorry. Finish yours. Please, no. Finish yours. I was just going to ask when when you go out of bring your own tool, app, whatever you like to call it. How does that intersect with compliance and security? I get that it, it varies from industry to industry. Like I think I mentioned earlier, you know, I, I basically worked in an entire project design with some of my message. Right? But you know, that's only persistent persistent to the extent that we keep our eye messages and then it's gone. If I did that in, in you know, Teams or Slack or you know Cisco or pick any any of the others where it's truly persistent, that's great. I can search it lives there forever, someone has to audit it. There's a way to do it. What happens on the on the sort of bring your own app or the one-off thing? Um, you know, how does that intersect with, with security and getting more compliance? I can't speak to that. We don't we don't allow new executables, let alone applications. I mean we exercise a great deal of control because we need to exercise a great deal of control. Um, I, I've been hearing Everyone's like, oh yeah, you want to use that app? And I'm like, wow, that's kind of laissez fair. And, and even my spouse, you know, she, she was like, oh yeah, I'm using this app at work and, you know, it's great and it's freemium or 
I think that's where we got to the intersection point that we brought up earlier when we said, hey, how do we cross over from, from personal to work, right? It's, it's hard to find value, uh, I mean, the value app that you use outside of work, but it's been helping you for X amount of years. Then we have these newer technologies. And I want to ask the room, like, how many people can swear that their Skype to business accounts no longer exist? They still probably have logins somewhere, okay. right? At one point, Skype for Business was the centralized place for video, and then we blink our eyes and we're talking about all these apps. It's giving us a forecast of what to expect. Let's hey, Mike, Mike, well, you know one thing, Tom, your point, the issue with the, um, the free-for-all you know, kind of illusion, it's not necessarily that. It's it, Think about it around the sense of data classification. So for example, you know, we choose Slack. Slack uh, does not have Confidential, uh, confidential file access. So, you know, from a stewardship perspective, it doesn't. We don't allow users within Slack to store, you know, data that is classified as, as confidential. But for Teams, we do. Uh, again, so again, it's that which tool when kind of mentality to make sure that we have the, the right tool set. And that's unfortunately why we have multiple tools is because of data classification, privacy rules, PII, PCI, all that stuff that does dictate a lot of the. The tool sets today. So your way to deal with it is to publish policies and guidelines, and and as long as you live with them, they have a little flow. And they ebb and flow, right? Because right. you know Slack could come through and say, okay, we've changed that control set. Now it can support what you say is is classified information or confidential information. So it might ebb and flow throughout the you know legacy of the, the product. So yeah, the product can rise up to your thresholds, right. and once right. it does, now it yeah. it gets re reclassified. Yeah. Let me add a question. So I just did a quick inventory of the apps that I use on a daily basis, actually Dave just supported that statement. But Teams, Zoom, Skype for Business, Skype, Modus Communicate, LinkedIn, WebEx, SharePoint, Salesforce, Instagram, Facebook, Outlook, and Messenger. So from a hardware perspective, from a security perspective, I understand particularly if you're in a financial community area, why security is important to not just share that but for collaboration, communication, my interact interface with dozens of people, both internal and external on a daily basis. And so, you know what? I also use the telephone. <laughs> so, What's a telephone? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I'm not actually older. So my, my point is, so I'm going to collapse these eight questions, mm -hmm. right, and say, so what? So what's the issue? What's the security if everybody brings to the table what tool they need, akin to you never dictate to a carpenter what tools he has in his toolbox. He chooses the tool he needs for the job. And so so I, think, I think that's OK depending on what industry you work in and what your particular role is within the company. Right? So you know, I, I compare managing data for myself and my work at Crestron versus where I am now. At Crestron, granted, there's a policy, I have some kind of broken rules, but there's a policy. Yeah, you have to do all this. But at the end of the day, right, if, if my laptop blew up, it's the company wasn't losing anything. All my sales stuff was in Salesforce, right? I'm not, I wasn't developing products. It, it's a nuisance for me. Where I work now, I can get audited. If I get audited, I have to turn information on. If I put certain bits of information out there, I have to have a plan that says how long it's going to be out there. And so the problem with all the different platforms, as you say, is that if I if I allow for too much variance or inconsistency across the board, I can't manage those things because I can't put controls on them. And so it puts my business at risk, right? Which is which is why I go back to the initial comment that I made. Every one of those apps, they're all they're all good. I use some of them myself. But the reality is I have to look at, if I put my corporate hat on, I have to look at what's the strategy that will best support my company and the growth in my company. And then that's what I need to put in place, regardless of whichever brand of Teams or Slack it is, or if I need more than one. So that, now that Mike has given you the correct answer, can I give you the cynical answer? <laughs> because I've been, been told that I might be a cynic, and this is probably the last word for this portion of this conversation. The reality is um, the economy that we're in and the industry that we're in needs to be one where there's a continuous recurring revenue stream. And all of these manufacturers and all these platform players know that they're not going to get you on a license, they're not going to get you on a purchase, they 
need to get you on a continuing revenue stream. So the hype as part of that, you know, hype may be good, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily mean it's bad, but it means that if you switch to our platform and only our platform and work within our platform, you're going to be more productive. The reality is if you do that, then you're going to be able to give them as much licensing on an ongoing basis as possible. So I'm kind of a skeptic when it comes to the team chat piece. When you need it, it's fabulous. But my reality is the same as yours, Jerry. My reality is I'm all over the place anyway. So I need to be as good on as many of the platforms as possible. But I realize there is no one platform. And a lot of these companies, the three you talked about, they're not as much slack, but the, 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 the teams of teams, I uh, won't mention the company names, uh, they, um, you know, they are now saying use this as the core of your business. Make your phone calls on it. Make your video calls on it. Share your documents on it. Use your, create your workflows around it. Because when you do that, we're going to keep getting checks from you. And my advice, personally, again, is use them when they're beneficial for you. And when they're not, be aware of them. But don't think you have to do everything there. I mean, I love the idea that, that on the Microsoft Teams platform, which is what my company uses, you know, I no longer have to do version control on documents. Same is true for G Suite. You put a document up and everybody just edits it. Um, there are some features of it I don't like. You use the features in the tool that benefit you the way you want them to benefit. Okay, Greg, you want to get the last word? I do have a quick question. Go, go, go. So the question I have is about guests. Right, because we all know we can invite people into chats and meetings and things like that. Sometimes. And yeah, and I, my company and some companies do let guests into our Teams environment. But then the multi-tenant switching and mm -hmm. notifications and all those kinds of things, I don't find it works that well. So I'm just curious what other people are doing. Buy the product we have today and we'll fix that for you next time. <laughs> yeah, great job coming. I think you nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Do you guys guess the last Do you let guess what your team? Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Right? Because we have all we all have partners, we all have people we're trying to work with, and that's a big thing. And Some of the team chat applications are better at bringing guests in than others. Unfortunately, the ones that are better at bringing guests are not as good as document share. Pick your poison. I've had a customer make me credentials to be in their team's environment so I can support them with white gloves. Without fear, yeah. Yeah, I was a complete. I yeah, had, there's. I had a, and at that point, they're paying. I think. And, right. and their security. And their security concerns right. that wrap around that also because you're not an employee of that company. Yeah, just use right. my name and password when you need to get in. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go right on another firewall. Yeah. Well, yeah. Can I have that new password also? <laughs> 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 it's your social security number. <laughs> <laughs> it's on the black net as well. <laughs> Michael, thank you. Give him a round of applause. Thank you. So we are going to launch you advance the slide.